Hey, hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the blog today. Uh, today I have with me Erin Bidlake, who is a yoga teacher, and she suffered with chronic illness herself and found yoga so helpful um, along her journey. And I'll let her speak more to that as we move forward. So hi Erin, thank you for being with us. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. And can you just tell us a little bit more about the work that you do and yourself and how you got to where you are right now? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so uh, about 20 years ago, no, 18 years ago, uh, I got very sick and I didn't know why. Um, I had really bad back pain and uh, digestive issues and um, just a lot of disparate symptoms that didn't really add up to anything that w was obvious. Um, and. Uh, I lived with chronic pain for many years um, and early on during that experience someone suggested I try yoga because I had been a very active person and I really missed being active but I was mostly bedridden at that point um, and uh, I needed some something to sort of get me in my body and so someone suggested yoga and at that point um, I'd heard of yoga but um, it wasn't really on my radar or something that I was, um, you know, would have gone and just done myself but with a little bit of uh, nudging from this friend I went and, you know, the, at first I, I just noticed that, um, you know, it, it didn't make anything worse um, and I enjoyed the uh, motivation to get out of bed and to go and do something in, in a group and social setting. Um, but after a while, I really found benefits starting to very subtly kind of emerge from the practice. So I found if I, if I was feeling very uh, depressed uh, and I would go and practice, I felt a little uplifted afterwards. Or if I was feeling very anxious and I would go and practice, I felt a little more calm and grounded afterwards. Um, and I, I really appreciated the, the way that the yoga was helping me with the mental, emotional uh, aspects of my, my chronic pain and my, my chronic illness and so I just kept doing it and it became a big part of my life um, and I uh, it just I had to do it every day. I got to the point where if I missed a practice I really felt it, I really missed it and um, so I became quite a dedicated practitioner um, without even thinking of ever becoming a teacher because my practice was just so focused on me and trying to get through my day as someone with chronic pain. Uh, eventually, though, uh, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease, so this is something that's in the news a lot right now, So, the, which is great. The awareness is growing around Lyme disease. Um, when I first uh, became symptomatic with Lyme disease 18 years ago, uh, it wasn't on people's radar in Canada, so it was easy to, to miss as a, for doctors to not see it. Um, so when I was diagnosed, uh, right away, you know, things started getting better. And uh, as soon as I started getting treatment for it, um, I, I really was one of the lucky ones. I know a lot of people with Lyme disease whose, whose treatment has taken um, you know, years and years and years. I was, I was treated for about four years, and, um, and during that time I, was, I did get better right, like, very consistently. I made consistent progress and with only a few little dips, so things, things got better. And as I regained my strength, I really started to think about how the yoga had helped me and I was meeting all kinds of people with Lyme disease and all kinds of people with chronic pain through um, networks that I was in and uh, support groups and things like that. And I just kept thinking, the yoga has helped me so much, um, I would love to bring this yoga to, to other people. Um, and uh, I had started to look into becoming a yoga teacher and I took um, my yoga teacher training here in Ottawa. and. Um, and yeah, I just started to, to teach and to, to to teach my own practice. You know, like I think that that's where that's where I think people can be most useful is when they teach out of their own practice and their own experience. So a lot of that is restorative yoga, and a lot of that is like very gentle movement and um, uh, a lot of breath work and. Um, Sort of just uh, just being with the body in, in whatever shape or form it is, like whether you're feeling great or not so great, you know, the the yoga has something that it can can give to you on any given day. So, so that's sort of how I became uh, the yoga teacher that I am today, which is I, I teach yoga full time now. Not all of it is for people with chronic pain, but I do work a lot with those groups of people, and uh, and yeah, I just I just love it. I'm so grateful that I can do this full time. Wow, that's amazing. And how long did it take you to get your diagnosis of Lyme disease? Gosh, okay. Uh, it took 
11 years. Wow. Yeah, I think that that's something that a lot of people with chronic pain and fatigue and Lyme disease can identify with, just that, that emotional turmoil of not even knowing what's wrong. Exactly. Yeah. And you mentioned so at first that yoga, the, the biggest thing you noticed about it is that it just didn't make anything worse. <laughs> and I identify with that a lot as well. That's, that's how I felt at first, too. It's like, oh, it's an activity I can do, and it didn't make things worse. That's the best. So for you or in your experience as a teacher, like, how long do you think it takes people to get to a point where they really start to feel a benefit other than, you know, it didn't make things worse, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the person we um, mm -hmm. do. Um, I think uh, some people are going to feel those benefits right away, and for other people it just takes a little longer, um, which is why I always tell my students, you know, don't just come to a class or two, like, you know, commit to a couple months of like a weekly practice, um, do what you can do because the, I, I feel like, especially with restorative yoga, the benefits are cumulative. So what you get from a single restorative yoga class, that's nice. You probably got a little snooze or a little relax, right? Uh, but uh, the, if you start to practice restorative yoga on a regular basis, um, you know, you're trying to get, in restorative yoga, you're trying to get into this this sort of headspace where you kind of drop out of um, kind of uh, you know awakeness, not quite into a sleepness, but do you know what I mean? Like into like pure relaxation. And it, it, I think the more you practice restorative yoga, the quicker you can drop into that space. So the first time you go, you might be like, you know, a little shifty, and you're and you're on your mat, and I'm not quite sure how to set up the props quite you know exactly the way you like it and so the first class you might think oh this this felt good it was nice but you know I could kind of take it or leave it whatever but the more you practice the more you know oh no I, I have to have my, my props this way or I have to have a block here or I need a little bit of a cushion there and you just start to know exactly how you want your prop set up how you want your position to, to be uh, so that's a lot faster and you're more comfortable because you know what you like and don't like and you don't have to fiddle with it too much and then once you're in the shape you just drop into that headspace a lot faster. Like it's like you just practice, and you get better at um, getting into that that place of, of pure restoration. Um, so I always tell my restorative students like, don't just come to a class. Like even if you enjoyed it, but you're, so, you're sort of an I can take it or leave it kind of place. Like mm -hmm. keep coming, and then you know that's how you get really addicted to restorative <laughs> yoga is by having that practice, and it's cumulative. So the more you do restorative yoga, the more benefits. Like they just sort of snowball. That's mm -hmm. been my experience, and anyway, and that's the experience that some people have have shared with me. The feedback I've been getting as a teacher. So mm -hmm. so I always try to encourage people to to make a commitment for. I don't know six to eight sessions maybe mm -hmm. perfect yeah that's great and I think that's so achievable to commit to two months of restorative sessions that's great um, so you have this quote on your website that I absolutely love um, and you say Buddhism teaches that pain is inevitable but suffering is optional um, and I love that so much I think that's so true so how for you how did yoga help you kind of differentiate between the pain and the suffering when you were living with Lyme disease that's a great question, um, and I teach on this. Um, I think this is one of the most important things um, that uh, that I can pass on to my students when we when we talk about this kind of um, the more philosophical side of yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really, it was I I read this quote uh, a long time ago in, in you know several years into my uh, my chronic pain. Um, and it kind of, it was, it was like a light bulb went off, you know, it was one of those big moments where, you know, you just, your paradigm just shifts and you can almost feel things rearranging in your head, like, you know, um, and because I, I just, it, it was amazing when I realized that because pain is inevitable. Pain is part of the human experience, right? Uh, we are we are wired. We are literally wired to feel pain, uh, and that's for a lot of good reasons, right? So that if we you know we touch the fire, we pull the hand out of the fire. Like there's important reasons why we feel pain in our bodies, and and it's an inevitable part of life that we're going to go through um, painful uh, experiences of, of you know getting sick or losing people we love, uh, growing old. Eventually, we're all going to die. You know, that's that's all very inevitable. Uh, but what's optional is the suffering, and, and I differentiate between suffering and pain as um, 
uh, pain is the, the raw feeling. It's, it's either a, like a feeling like hand in the fire or a feeling like, um, you know, a parent just died. It's that raw emotional feeling. But suffering is the story. So uh, you, build your, you build your stories around the pain sometimes, um, depending on it. Uh, so for example, some of the stories I was telling myself when I was suffering from chronic pain, um, I, uh, I tell myself that uh, this, is gonna, this, is, this is it, this is the rest of my life. Like I had been in chronic pain for several years, there was no end in sight, and I just thought, that's it. I mean, I might as well, I might as well just die now because I'm uh, there's nothing in life for me now because I can't do the things I want to do. I, I had to drop out of school and I can't pursue the things I was interested in and um, I feel like I'm out of options and so what's the point of even going on like this? You know, mm -hmm. That was a story to myself. Um, they say when, when people have chronic pain there's, there's three kind of false stories that they say um, that uh, it's permanent so that was my feeling, it was, it was permanent, uh, that it's all pervasive, so that it touches all the aspects of your life, there's nothing that's unsullied by your chronic pain, um, people believe that, and the last is that it's personal, and that one also was, was tough for me because I always thought, well, what have I done to deserve this? Um, it felt like it was a personal attack on me that I have this pain, um, that I had done something, I was being punished in, for, for something, um, you know, these are the just the, this was what was causing my suffering. These storylines, um, just uh, and and that was also separate from the actual physical pain that I was feeling. So I could say that yeah, like my back really hurts, or um, for a while my arms were really bad and I couldn't couldn't do things with my arms and and but yeah, okay, so my my arm hurts. Like here's an arm and it hurts and it's pain. You know, I feel the pain. I feel it in my my nervous system. My brain is registering pain response. You know, like there's that whole thing. But separate from that, and much, much, much more difficult to live with than that is the, the story I was telling myself about that, how I, I'd done something to deserve this pain, or um, uh, you know, I was never going to, to, to amount to anything because of this pain. You know, that's, that's the suffering. And so that's what I, I when I started to ch -ch 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 in my mind, like, oh, there's a difference between these two. And one, like, is inevitable, we can't get away from it. But the other is optional. So, okay, so if it's optional, and that was the big question for me, how do I opt out, right? I want to opt out of this. If it's optional, like, sign me up for the opt out. You know, where's the opt out? <laughs> um, so that became my real work, was figuring mm -hmm. to opt out of the suffering, the story. Wow, yeah, that's amazing. I think that's so important. And I think I came there as well. I had less of an aha moment and more of a very slow, slow resistance field place to get there. I don't know if you experienced this, um, but for me, when I was ill with chronic fatigue syndrome, I was very lucky to have a very supportive family, but there was a lot of people who just didn't really believe me. They didn't believe that chronic fatigue was real, or they didn't believe it was a thing, and they would kind of say, oh, it's, it's all in your head, you need to go to therapy, you're depressed. And so I had so much resistance to having any sort of mental part of my illness because I was like, no, it's physical, it's real, I'm really feeling this fatigue and this pain in my body. And I eventually did come to the same conclusions as you, that yes, I am feeling this pain and fatigue in my body, but it's not permanent, it's not forever, it's, this is just how it is right now. Um, but yeah, I think that for me, and I think for others as well, it took me so long to get to that spot because of some of the negative connotations that I was getting around my illness. And I don't know if I would have gotten there without a yoga and meditation practice. Mm -hmm. That's great to share the story. Um, uh, do you do any other kind of self-care habits or healthy activities other than yoga? I don't know if you do meditation or any other forms of exercise or follow any diet. Yeah, well, I mean, I consider myself in remission from Lyme disease, so I'm, I'm asymptomatic, but I'm... Uh, I believe, and I think that this is sort of agreed upon, that uh, when you have a, a late stage diagnosis like I did, like it took me so long to get diagnosed from Lyme disease, mm -hmm. that I'll always have it in my body and that um, my, my work now that I'm asymptomatic is just to keep my immune system strong enough to keep it at bay so that the symptoms never come back. So that's always foremost in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I have to take really good care of myself, um, which I am better at. At on some days than others. Um, I, uh, yoga is my, my, my main go-to, but uh, I do have a meditation practice. Um, I find that really, oh, I just find the meditation and the yoga go hand in hand. Like I, uh, 
Uh, when I do my home practice now, it's uh, it's a lot less physical than it used to be. A lot, I mean, many fewer asana and uh, and more more sitting time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in terms of other kinds of things, yeah, I, I ride my bike. So in the summer, oh, I love to ride my bike. I feel so powerful and strong when I'm on my bike. So that's a really big part of um, how I take care of myself in the summer is uh, just being out on my bike and. Um, I, I have a really strict, careful diet, which um, I actually really struggle with, and I have struggled with for a long time, um, because I've worked with so many different practitioners over the years that have given me different prescribed diets, and um, sometimes I feel like there's just no solid ground to stand on when it comes with, to nutrition. Like there's mm-hmm. nothing that you can really say like across the board. Everyone agrees that this is a good thing to eat. Because <laughs> I've had some. Practitioners say, like, you know, eat a plant-based diet. Others are saying, you know, no, you need animal protein to heal your gut. Um, you know, just different things like that. Like, just like mm-hmm. I, uh, my diet has flip-flopped in so many directions so many times um, that uh, I, I really struggle with feeding myself. But mm-hmm. um, it's something that I prioritize. Yeah, I definitely understand that struggle. <laughs> it seems to be always changing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you find that your yoga or meditation practice has helped at all with that? Like, are you a bit more in tune with what foods your body is reacting to, or is it a bit of a mystery? Yeah, I don't know. Um, like, I, I have a very sensitive system now, and it wasn't always like that. I used to be, I, you know, pride myself on having, like, a like an iron stomach. You know, I can <laughs> eat anything, and I could, you know, I, I, I it's just nothing seemed to, to bother me. I could just eat anything I wanted. I mean, that was decades ago, but um, since my whole Lyme experience and, and the Lyme and the yoga has really happened side by side, so who knows mm-hmm. which is which is to credit or which is to blame, but um, I have a very sensitive system now, so yeah, like I do feel myself like, um, like I can tell right away if I've eaten something that doesn't agree with me, and um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I am more attuned to, to the kinds of things I put in my body for sure. Mm-hmm. All right, now just a couple kind of fun questions. Yeah. Uh, so what's one thing you're able to do now that you couldn't do when you first became ill that you just absolutely love? Oh, handstands. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I, I, uh, I've been working on my handstand um, okay. for a couple years now. And, uh, you know, I, I there was a point in my life where I couldn't use my arms. Um, I couldn't make myself a sandwich. I couldn't. Um, I couldn't wash my own hair. Uh, mm-hmm. My husband was brushing my teeth for a little while. I couldn't use my hands. Yeah, and the idea that I went from that to being able to do handstands is is just it makes me feel so so strong and powerful. So I love my handstands. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> And then the last question. So if a kid walked up to you in the street and he wanted to know your number one tip on starting to try yoga, what would it be? Uh, go with a sense of humor. Like, have fun with it. Mm-hmm. People are so serious in yoga classes. <laughs> and I'm always, I'm always trying to crack jokes. And, um, uh, and people, I, I get these looks back like, you know, are you actually telling a joke in a yoga class? <laughs> Am I supposed to laugh? Like, I'm, you know? <laughs> I mean, just have a sense of humor about it, um, and uh, just you know, give, give yourself a pat on the back just for showing up. Because people are so hard on themselves when sometimes when they start a yoga practice and they're so down on how they, you know, you don't know how tight you are until you start to stretch, right? And people get so down about it, thinking like, oh, like I'm so, I'm so tight, and. Um, I just think that, uh, yeah, that awareness is a good thing, but it's not something, you know, it's not something that you need to feel bad about, that you're here, so stretch, have fun with it, um, feel your body. Yeah, mm-hmm. great. All right, thank you so much. So if people want to find out more about you or they want to take one of your classes, where can they go? How can they find you? Yeah, the best way to check in with me is on my website, And uh, My class schedule is there, and there's a contact form. They can definitely get in touch that way. And I have a blog with some uh, some entries if they want to read a little bit more about my ideas around uh, pain being inevitable but suffering being optional. It's A lot of it's right there, so they can go and dig in. Amazing. Thank you so much for talking with us today. Well, thank you so much. Thanks.